Hi, everybody. My name is Mary Epoletti Smith from Maddie's Fund. Thank you for joining us today. This is something new for us. This is our very first candid conversation about diversity, equity, and inclusion with one of our movement's um, heavy hitters, Ed Jamison, who is the head of Dallas Animal Services, at least through Friday. <laughs> Starting Monday, Ed has a new position with Operation Kindness as their CEO. Ed has really been um, a leader for so many of us in um, animal welfare, some of the accomplishments at Dallas Animal Services and the amazing team he's put together are really things that are unprecedented. So it's really um, with a great deal of excitement and a little bit of a heavy heart that uh, we spend the next 30 minutes or so with Ed Jamison. So we're gonna start with a video. We had a chance to talk with Ed a couple of weeks ago and now we're gonna share this with you. Hey everybody, I am Ed Jamison, the director for Dallas Animal Services. Prior to that, I was in the chief animal control officer for the city of Cleveland. And I started my animal welfare career at a suburb of Cleveland called Garfield Heights uh, around 2015 or so and had been working for, the, for that city since 2001. Found my way into animal welfare through that service department. They were training people for um, animal control to help with overtime, uh, whatnot. And I, I trained for that and, and instantly fell in love with it. You're not only able to help people, but you're also able to help animals. I did a lot of reflecting this year on my time in Iraq. I was in Iraq in, in 03 and in, in, in 04. Um, and, and it was really hard to not be judgmental. I mean, we, we were literally, I mean, we were in a war zone when you don't know who's shooting at you or who wants you dead or alive. Um, but I saw so much compassion when you see just rows of little children standing on the side of the road, hoping you give them a water bottle. Of, of all the things I took from that, that deployment, I will never get those kids' faces out of my, out of my head. They're, they have always been there and they were just trying to get through the day. They were literally trying to survive. As everything comes together, you know, almost 20 years later into taking that same type of stance that um, we need to start from a place of that people are trying to do the best that they can and that they're going to need some help to try to um, not just get through their day, but then hopefully, you know, set them on a path and do your little part in their life on their journey through life. As a black man, um, as that by, by my count, one of only maybe five black shelter leaders in the, in the entire country. I hadn't looked at it like that before. I knew that I looked different than most. Um, you go to conferences, other shelter leaders, great people, but um, there, there weren't many people that looked like me. I, I'd gone my whole life just trying to do good work and not talking about race. Um, and this last year has really changed that. It's a really difficult industry. We say we wanna be more inclusive, People that are in leadership roles have to be intentional about being inclusive. Um, it starts at the top. So whether you are of color or you're not of color, you need to be intentional about looking. I guarantee, be it in your organization, throughout your community, um, there are, are qualified people that if you reach out to them, you can start to bring them into, into the mix. When you're being intentional, it means that it is at the front of your mind and that it's you, you are actually looking for something or looking to make an action happen. So you're not going to be inclusive just by saying you want to be inclusive. You have to actually go out and invite people that have not been invited before. You're going to have to have conversations with people that you might not have talked to before. Um, you're going to have to let people in that historically haven't been in. But it's not. Um, enough to simply say how many people of color work in my agency. We broke it down into different pay ranges and um, we're at on the org chart are the people um, of, of all, all races and colors. But as we went down through those ranks, um, it, it, you know, to just have it all at the bottom end or you're only people of color, you're not being intentional about making opportunities. You made opportunities for them to get in the door, but you're not being intentional about them being able to move up in, in their career. 
We have an extremely diverse workforce at Dallas Animal Services, which I'm very proud of, every single one of them. But they need to see that they can aspire to continue to elevate. This industry needs to have more diversity because many of the communities that we are serving um, are very diverse communities. We're doing everything in our power to serve the, the, the humans and the animals throughout the city. You know, I'm so happy with the, with the city of Dallas process. When it comes to budgeting, we actually have an equity tool that we have to put all of our numbers through to talk about um, who is it serving? Um, is it equitably, equitably being served through, throughout the city? And I encourage whether you are a government shelter or a nonprofit shelter to um, acquire some type of an equity tool to see how the services that you're providing, are they actually reaching the people that need them most? Dallas is cut in half by Interstate 30. When you do that veterinary search, a simple Google map, you will see two or three clinics south of Interstate 30, while you see 15 or 20 north of Interstate 30. And it's the exact same thing when you say pet stores. Now, when we look at our areas that we are actually operating in, my field officers, 70% of everything we do is south of Interstate 30. So you can stick your head in the sand and pretend that, hey, simply because impounds and enforcement things are happening south of 30, that, um, and then we'll go and we'll place all the animals north. We have not. Our adoption numbers actually we're adopting back into the communities that we are actually getting the animals from. And some people hate the idea of that. As we start to embrace the community that needs us the most, that it has the least amount of resources and we're able to point them in a, to the, in the direction of that resource, we're actually seeing the number of repeat times that you're having interactions with that same individual or that same animal are starting to drastically decrease. January 15th of 2019, I briefed our city council and we talked about the 22,500 citations and we have this fix a ticket citation but I can tell you not just because of COVID, but um, with life after um, George Floyd and, and people actually really listening to social justice, that it, as a person of color, I don't want DAS to write 22,000 citations a year moving forward. I still want to help as many people get into compliance, but we have to find a way that um, some of the enforcement, I think there's a lot of people that want to get into compliance, that want to do the right thing. And we, we, we're going to have to be better at reaching them without the ticket being the mechanism to help get them there. So you can, your, your interaction is simply you're going to take your pet away and we'll go place it somewhere else as opposed to embracing them um, and actually listening to them about what it is that they need. It's if you're looking for long term success, um, you're going to find that with your community, um, but not if you're missing the people that need you the most. Simply removing a dog from an underserved area and trying to, to place it in a better served area, that doesn't fix any long term. Um, situation at all. It's better to work with that pet that they already have a bond with and see what it is that you can do to, to, to fix their solution. Again, a hole in the fence that the, the gate latch not working properly uh, and a simple understanding of the, the city's ordinances that everything has to be restrained in the city of Dallas at, at all times when it's outside. The importance of a microchip and how easily that makes for us to be able to get dogs back to their owners. Root causes is, is something that we, we have been putting a lot of focus on, and I, I, I think that we're starting to see the rewards of looking at the root cause, not simply one at a time, let's just get through this situation, let's find something that, that's going to last. So we really, really try to hammer that home here at, at DAS to get rid of the judgment. There's just not room. If people are here, it means that they knew they could come to us. And if you start from that premise that they're here because they had enough trust to come to you, then don't make them feel bad about looking for the services that you provide. But now you're talking to somebody on the phone, they realize that, wow, this person really just needed a crate. This person really just needed a couple of bags of food. Um, they were at their wood's end, they love their pet. Um, and this was a last resort for them. I think if you go from it, from a helping um, the person standpoint, you're gonna ultimately help, help thousands more animals than, than you were in the past if you start with trying to help the person. So we had a really long adoption application that it was just very cumbersome. It was about five pages long. So I instructed the team, 
hey, we need to shorten this. How much of this really needs to be in here? So it got shortened down to about two pages. And in with, with the great team members that were putting it, th- you know, putting it together. Well, this summer, again, it's one of the first places I started at when we were trying to be equitable and make sure what type of barriers do we have in place that might be hindering people or making it a not very inclusive place for people to come. The uh, application had changed to a two-page questionnaire, but there were still questions on there. They were done with the intention to spark conversations, but when you look at it through a DEI lens, they actually could be offensive um, and they, they could put up barriers. When people of color are two times more likely to rent than to own, whether you're doing it on purpose or not, you systematically are excluding people of color because they're two times more likely. You're excluding all, all renters. It's been so much more successful once we made that shift that, again, the intention was to do a conversation, but we felt we were actually making people lie because they were terrified of, if I answer this honestly, they might not let me adopt this pet. You have to be intentional to be anti-racist. You absolutely have to, because there are so many policies that used to just be industry standards that have walls that make it very, very hard for people to feel included. Because this is such a difficult industry, it's extremely emotional, and, and it has not historically been very diverse. It starts with being intentional. Be intentional about looking to be inclusive. Be intentional about um, supporting your staff. Be intentional about meeting your community where they're at. Be intentional about doing the hard things. Whenever you're trying to improve, and I'm so fortunate that I have a team that is constantly wanting to improve, you can improve if you're not willing to look at yourself. So that it's something I've done um, personally and individually my entire life. I've never pretended that I have all the answers or that I am the best at anything, but I have no problem looking at myself to say, okay, I've got a shortcoming here. Um, You can cry about it, you can ignore it, or you can address it. And we always go to the, let's address it. Here's a shortcoming. There's always some way to get around a barrier that if you have the desire to do so. Again, to have a staff of a little over 200 that to a T, they're all willing to look at themselves when we have a complaint. I say, okay, let's start at this. Let's, what did you do in this situation? And we kind of walk through it. Okay, what did they do? And it, it just allows you to, I think, make better course corrections. Even if the situation is already done, it can make you make better decisions mo- moving forward. But if you're not willing to look at yourself, you're not going to get anybody who's um, going to follow you. You can't lead if you're not willing to look at yourself. Wow, Ed, that was just incredible. Seriously, I wanted to keep stopping the tape so that I could take more notes. And it's just, you've given us so much information. I just want to say congratulations, Ed, on your new position. And I'm, I think that you are going to just, for as much as you accomplished in Dallas and in a municipal shelter, you're going to be able to do even more with Operation Kindness and being able to provide a huge safety net for shelters in uh, North Texas. And I I couldn't be more excited. So, um, wow, you just took, I I feel like we should start a movement called Take the Pledge to change your adoption policies. It should be something like, you know, the uh, Be Dallas 90 or something. I'm going to have to work on that. But Ed, what advice would you give to others who want to try to approach the community, engage them in a way that they hadn't done before. I, I think that probably everybody on this call knows of a story or even themselves of when they got denied a service, uh, typically a, a adopting an animal or trying to help at, out at a shelter. When you, when you think about all the things that we have under the name of protecting animals and don't Nobody get it confused that I'm not for giving an animal to an animal abuser or to a dog fighter or, or anything at all like that. But if 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 you say that you really truly want to be inclusive, anything that you have that is set up to say no to somebody, then it, then it's a barrier. So you need to start with looking at what what things do we have that are trying to find a way to say no to somebody as opposed to trying to say yes. So, um, and it's hard. We've all, probably most of the people on this call have gotten blasted. I've seen Timmy Sullivan from Cleveland, Ohio is on this call 
And she's the one who got me to do my first uh, reduced fee adoption in the city of Cleveland. And I myself will know if they're not going to pay full price, there's no way. There's no way. And I, I always try to listen to Timmy and I did. And we, we kept our numbers for that adoption event and realized we had even less adoption returns during, during that event. And that started me down the trend. But if you're not willing to try, um, you will get the same results if you continue to, to do the same thing. That's, I didn't, you know, that's, that's not a quote from Ed. Everybody knows that. But yet in this industry, we over and over and over again, do the same thing and somehow think that this next time around, it's going to be different. So I think I said that word intentional about 40 times in that interview. That's kind of the, the biggest takeaway is you need to be intentional, even when you know the, the wall you're about to run into is going to sometimes be apprehension from the people that, that you're working with. That, but no, we're going to try to do this different because we want to get a different result. Thank you, Ed. So, Ed, if you were able to um, wave a you know, magic wand and create the ideal animal welfare movement, what would that look like for you? Actually, it's, it's really pretty easy. Again, numbers don't lie. And, and people who are against you, that's one thing people who don't like Ed will say he always goes to numbers. Well, because they're, they're not lying unless you're saying that the actual data itself is wrong. But think about the areas that there's high numbers of animals. Um, they obviously want animals. And when you can shift your brain into that, that look, they obviously want animals. So instead of being this occupational force um, going in with all of this enforcement, why are you trying to relocate? The, the cycle just keeps happening over and over and over again. Okay, even if the animal gets taken, they're going to end up with another one. So again, unless they're doing something that's abusing an animal, you know, flat out neglect out of them not wanting to give the animal um, what it is that they need. Um, but I, I think if we really started to embrace, um, people love animals and there's all over the country People want to have animals. So there, there's some, to me, pretty easy answers, but we're going to have to do some hard things. Um, and that is really embracing people right where they're at. Again, we're, we're transporting animals thousands of miles sometimes, driving right past places that actually need those animals and would like those animals. So if we could get rid of some of the judgment and start embracing the animals where they're at, you'd be amazed. You saw the Google map on there um, for Dallas. There's no resources in the South, none. And so to put a judgment on somebody that they haven't had an animal to the vet before, there's not a vet within 30 miles of, of, you know, some of those locations. So starting with that as a judgment, as opposed to, okay, if we take the veterinary service to you, will you use it? Well, absolutely we will. So I I think that that's my perfect world. Magic wand is, is really start meeting people where they're at and we'll get so much further in this industry. So I think we should all take this recording and use it as our uh, inspiration every week to get us going, to uh, really be able to make a difference. Uh, Somebody, oh, Allison, thank you for putting uh, the link to the B Dallas 90. I'll tell you guys, if you want to see a great website um, for a municipal shelter, as well as for any animal welfare group, you should check out this new website. It is really incredible. It does such a great job of providing access to information that people will need and want. Ed, my hat's off to you and your team for the great creative effort. That was so cool. So when you think of all the things over your career in Dallas that you have done from, you know, donning a pet suit, or was that Ryan on the stage of no, innovation <laughs> show? Yes. I thought it was you as you, um, Oh yeah. We won't go into what you did with that costume, but anyway, it was definitely um, there's it pretty much. I realized Ed that you would humble yourself for anything on, you know, if it meant that you could save more animals, but as you think about um, your career there, what um, like give us, something that pops to mind as a highlight, something that you're most proud of? The super high level, it's just the people. We talk about with adoptions and people, but my people in this building, some of them worked here for years before I got here, had a million different leaders, saw all kinds of things. um, And I had to start trusting the people as well, show them that they were supported. And again, a lot of them were here. We we brought in a lot of people from coast to coast, but um, really the people, um, super high level. Um, more granular level, you and I had talked about it. Um, and I had actually forgot about it until a recent news, news story, but, um, 
the time when City Hall was flipping out over the ducklings that couldn't jump out of the, the man-made pond in front of Dallas City Hall. Um, and they, they were flipping out. And I just said, screw it, and rolled up my pants, tossed my dress shoes to the side and jumped in and built a ramp for the ducklings to get out. And the ironic part is once the ducks finally got out, they walked about five feet to the edge and then jumped back in. But at least I knew they had a ramp that they could find, find their way out. <laughs> that is great. I just love that story. So what do you tell yourself? to keep going when it gets a little tough? What are those, well, what motivates you? Well, I try to practice what I preach. Um, and what, to my team, it's always, we try to win the day. And if you, you win more days than you lose, you're going to do pretty well um, in this industry. And you just start racking up wins. Um, but in order to win the day, you've got to stay focused. And when you try to win a situation and you lose. And sometimes it's not out of a bad attempt. It's not out of a bad mistake. Sometimes you fight really hard and you just don't get the result that you want to focus on um, the wins. Again, everybody on this call, um, again, I know a lot of people on here. You do so many phenomenal things throughout the course of the day, from the person you just helped reunite with their pet to the person you match up with a new pet to the person you help point to a service. There are so many more wins in our industry but we know that it is um, people will harp on one loss on one thing that didn't go well and blow it up as if that is the everyday all day. So winning the day and, and breaking it down to all of the small wins that you had throughout the course of your day um, is, is really what I have to try to do when things start to get pretty heavy. All right. I'd like to open this up a little bit to the audience. Uh, anyone have any questions for Ed or comments that they would like to share? You know, animal welfare people are so shy. Mackenzie's got her hand raised. Hi, I'm Mackenzie from Los Angeles. Um, I have a question about when you're talking to your community about DEI work and why it's important in animal welfare um, and, you know, why equity is important in our communities and how that affects our animals. How do you get that conversation going? Because... I know that sometimes when we try to talk about it in animal welfare, volunteers or donors or supporters will say like, let's not talk about that. You know, we're focused on animals, like this is too political or, you know, whatever, they were comfortable with the conversation. How do you steer that conversation into why this is gonna be a better outcomes for all animals if we're supporting DEI work and equity? Yeah, no, and it's a great question, and it's hard, um, and especially in our in our animal welfare. I feel very fortunate. The city of Dallas puts equity um, at the forefront, so there's already a venue. And at least in government world, it's easy to say, council person, which person walking in our door from your district am I supposed to discriminate against? Can can you point out to me which which one? How many tattoos is too many tattoos that they're not worthy, or how many piercings are too many piercings? So in government world, you've got that that at least publicly. Politicians certainly aren't going to raise their hand and say, yes, I want to discriminate unless it's someone that they've had a million animal control issues with in their district or whatever. Um, I'm really excited because, as Mary said, I am headed to the nonprofit side um, that next week. And it was really, really important. Uh, my first conversation with the board president, um, I talked about diversity um, and that uh, where I'm at as a, as a man of color and that it wasn't something that. I talked about a lot before really June of last year, but I do now. I realize there's not many people that look like me in my, my situation. So I'm in a little better situation <laughs> um, simply because I can talk about it because it, because it's me. Um, knowing that there's not a lot of people of color of leadership, it doesn't make it any less important or um, less than the need to, to have it. Um, but it is hard because this industry has been so judgmental and it's always judging the people. Um, always. I'm doing this for the animal. I'm doing this for the animal. But you can't have a positive outcome for an animal without a human on the other side of it. Um, and so the same people yelling about euthanasia or about animals being put down. Again, in Dallas, before COVID, we we're bringing 120 animals a day is what our intake was in 2019. Um, and I would still never just willy nilly give somebody an animal knowing that they, they had all of this history and all these bad things didn't happen when we removed the, the barrier. So um, again, whether you're government or you're nonprofit, I, I think it's really important about if we want to, everyone will say they want to be inclusive, but you really have to put your money where your mouth is, which is where um, 
Mary Smith from Maddie's Fund um, from the onset of really um, social justice. She, she knew it. And as a funder, they've got a lot to say about this. And that is, I think that the funders are going to stop funding places that are not being inclusive in their practices. So try to attach yourself to groups like Maddie's Fund that put their money where their mouth is. And that money does talk as far as resources that I don't think they're going to want to fund places that are not, not being inclusive. Thank you, Ed. That was great. Sarah, I see a question from you in the um, chat. Sarah Lofthans wants to know, what are some of the best ways you might suggest to identify people who love dogs or cats in local BIPOC communities? Um, the, the short answer is to get out in the community um, in a non-threatening way. That That's the number one is to get there. We all, myself included, we're really good at thinking we know what people want. Um, and then it's amazing when you actually get out there and you open your ears, people will tell you totally different. So um, finding the people that have the voice, there were a lot of parts of Dallas. They didn't want anybody with any authority, just the past really bad history, not just in animals, but in a lot of things in Dallas, they didn't want to see a code vehicle, a police vehicle, a fire truck, unless something truly was burning down. Um, and little things that for my officers, when I'd be out there in the field with my officers, they'd see me waving at everybody. And I'm like, director, what the hell are you doing? And it was once we, we shifted gears into this, that we're here friendly here, we're just driving by, we're looking in case anybody needs help. And, and we tried to take some of the threat off of why we are there um, and simply make yourself available. I tell them, try to ride with your windows rolled down so you can hear if somebody is trying to talk to you when you drive, drive by. Um, and you just have to start to interweave yourself in the communities um, if you're actually it, interweaving and willing to listen um, is going to get you the, the, the furthest ahead by actually being able to hear what they need. And again, probably what you think they need is going to be less than what that, that individual community needs. Hey, Ed, I have a question for you that um, and it sort of points to the fact that DEI can't be something that operates on the sidelines it has to be front and center. It really needs to be that primary filter that everything goes through. Will you talk a little bit about what you found when you looked at your data about stray, what you would consider to be stray animals? Again, that, that's another, we all thought we knew everything in this industry, but the, the, the study that our DAS team um, worked with, with a gentleman from overseas, the return to owner, we took from our return to owners in 2019, and, and so this told us a couple couple of things, but um, the vast overwhelming what the city of Dallas was calling a stray was not. There was some sign of ownership on, on that animal. So I thought I was coming to this wild west of unowned dogs, um, you know, with tumbleweed coming down, you know, blowing down the street and just the dogs were running everything. Um, once we really, really started recording, we were finding that there was an owner behind the vast majority of these animals. On occasion, the animal born in an abandoned house or in a, in a, in a woods or something like that. Um, so then right there, that allowed us to start finding answers with the humans and stop trying to find all the answers in the animals that usually there's a human answer behind, behind these things. Um, and then another interesting thing from that study was that um, the dogs actually did an actual return to owners. And I was, 88% of the, the dogs were no more than a hundred yards from their house. So, um, you know, we tell all these great stories and these great ventures that these dogs go while, while they're loose. And the, the reality is, is they're probably in their neighborhood, which short um, to get to it is it allows you to try to find answers connecting with their human. Why is the animal getting loose? What, what is the problem that, you know, he, he's not able to be confined and you usually find some human element as to why the animal's not, not contained as opposed to just, Hey, he's just wild and he just runs everywhere. It's usually, they can't afford to fix the fence. Um, don't, don't have proper restraint. Um, but there's going to be a human answer behind that, not an animal answer behind it. Thanks, Ed. And then let's take one more question. Sarah, do you want to, um, Sarah Rosenberg, would you like to unmute and say your question? Sure. Hey, thank you. Um, so my question speaks to, um, to comments that, I have frequently heard as a volunteer, as a someone who works with other volunteers and in shelters, um, the comments around when they see an animal that they perceive people perceive as suffering or a stray animal in bad condition. Um, I've heard people say, oh, I just, I hate people. I hate people. Um, and what I, what I want, I would like to hear from you. How would you encourage leadership 
in organizations, animal welfare organizations, because leadership is where the information, it was where the directives really come from, right? It's going to take intentionality and leadership, as you said. How do you encourage leadership to diffuse that commentary, that sort of, oh, I hate people, I love animals, but I hate the people who do this to them. How, how can you encourage that? Tease that out. Yeah, it, it's, it's, I think, twofold. Again, that a person might have done something really bad to an animal, and that's, that happens, and that is horrible. All people didn't do that to the animal. In fact, most people wouldn't have done whatever that horrible thing is. And you, I'm sure you've seen it, too, when you can get beat up pretty quick, whether you're on the streets of Dallas, streets of Cleveland, streets of just about anywhere, and pretty quick. You don't have to be out on the streets for a day to come in looking and people have all these big stories. And then you find out this family has been frantically looking for this dog who ran away yesterday and there was no big crazy story behind it. Um, I can tell you and anybody who's listening here and um, whether you're a leader, um, if you want to work for Ed Jamison saying in the interview, you hate people. So you want to work for animals is the fastest way to not get hired by me. I, <laughs> I, and it's been said multiple times over my career. People think that's what I want to hear because you're going to have to embrace humans. Um, and again, on occasion, people will do a bad thing. It, it does. It happens. Um, I think acknowledging that when that goes, people will sensationalize that one out of a million times. We don't make policies out of one in a million. We're going to make policies out of what happens the, the, the majority of the time. Um, but I, I think having those real talks that if somebody really does need enforcement and there really is, no, this person needs to be turned over to the DA. This is horrible what they did. That's fine. But not all humans. There's, there's no place that there's no sanctuary that the animals would just take care of themselves and live without the help of humans behind them. And I think it gets to my absolute favorite shirt. I almost wore it for this is, is the um, be a good human shirt. The Maddie's fun, be a good human t-shirt. It's my go-to that whenever I'm looking for, and it's kind of what, you know, tells me we just have to start being better to people. And it's amazing. The ripple effect in all of our realm on the animal world that when you start, when, we got rid of the judgment at the front door at DAS. It was amazing how the interactions changed. There were way less us calling security over somebody screaming and yelling when we got rid of the judgments. And hey, the whole intention here is to listen to people and let's try to find a solution. So you can't control all humans, but most humans, when you treat them well, they'll treat you well back in return. Okay, everyone. That was all the time we had for this portion of the entertainment. Ed is going to be available on Maddie's Pet Forum to answer any questions you have. And um, Ed, I just can't thank you enough for being here today for all the amazing work that you have done. I'm, I can't tell you how much I enjoyed being at Dallas Animal Services back when you could actually visit shelters in person and see people. And um, knowing that everything that you've talked about today, I was able to sort of see live and in person, the amazing staff that you've created, the relationships they have with people in the community. It was such a great experience. Plus, I was able to get more than 10,000 steps in because Dallas Animal Services is a big facility as everything in Texas is. So that was sort of the sidebar uh, advantage to being there. But anyway, as I said, I would encourage you all, if you have any questions about anything related to municipal shelters, you know, having life-saving programs, uh, encouraging and incentivizing your teams, really, Ed is available to share the experiences that he's had with over 20 years in, um, you know, the public sector. So please join me in thanking Ed again. It was just an amazing opportunity. Thank you, Ed. You're my hero. Thanks for having me on your on your first candid conversation, Mary. There, no, nobody I'd rather do it with. You, you, don't get more candid than Mary Smith. <laughs> Lord have mercy. All right, you guys. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs>